Now, I'd like to go back today for a little while, and uh, I'll, I'll try not to keep you too long, uh, young guys at camp. Um, from Exodus chapter 3, over the summer months, I'm going to look at uh, some of the stories surrounding the Exodus and uh, uh, around Moses. And today we're going to look just very casually, very briefly at the uh, call of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Now, I've just come back from holiday in the northwest highlands of Scotland, and as you can tell from the great tan I've got, the weather there was fantastic, and uh, wasn't indoors much, but one evening I was indoors and uh, watched a film, and the film was called Into the Wild, I don't know if anyone, have, any of you have seen it, um, it's, uh, I'm not going to tell you the plot really, the story. well I'll tell you a little bit, because otherwise the story wouldn't make sense, but I'll not give the ending away if you ever want to watch it, okay, and it's really just about a guy in America who, you know, He's older than you guys at camp. He's gone through school and he's uh, gone through university and he's graduated in law. And his dad's very career-minded and really wants him to push on and uh, do all the things that, that he should do as a career lawyer. But he's got no interest and he thinks his dad and mum don't listen to him and he's had, they've been struggling and fighting and it's been a miserable time. And he ends up just leaving, not telling anyone where he's going. Doesn't tell his sister, doesn't tell his friends, anything. Just Sort of becomes completely anonymous, leaves, because he wants to kind of go around America, discover himself or whatever, and end up having a great adventure in Alaska. Now, I'm not going to tell you what all, he meets a lot of different people uh, in that story. It's based on a, it's a true story. It's based on a true event. But there's a very profound line in the story near the end. Uh, if I'd been organized enough, I might have put it on the screen for you, but I didn't. Uh, and he's not very well at this point, and he's on his own in a caravan in the middle of Alaska. And he writes with very kind of faint and feeble writing, because he's weak by this point through illness. Happiness is only real when shared. And he came to that conclusion that while he was looking for all the happiness he could, just doing his own thing, forgetting all his friends and family and, and parents and everything, he realized that happiness is only real when it's shared. And, and that's absolutely right, isn't it? It's absolutely right. See, when you score a goal or when your team, uh, someone in a famous football team scores a goal, what they usually do they usually all gather around one another because they want to share the happiness of that moment. When Andy Murray won Wimbledon, he went to share that event with, although there was hundreds, hundreds of thousands watching and, and people there, he went to share it with those closest to him because happiness is an event that's shared. And God is a God of love. He's not a big, solitary, lonely individual in heaven who uh, kicking about heaven looking for people to be friends with and to be happy with. So he made the world. It's not like that. God is, is love, and God has this shared perfect happiness. He's had it from all eternity in the complexity of him being God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this great relationship of shared happiness. He's never been a lonely God. He's never been on his own. And he wants us to know, however you look for happiness, maybe in sport or in careers or in wealth or in whatever it might be, he's wanting us to know that true happiness is only ever found when it's shared with him, with God. God's so important that only true happiness can be found when we share our lives with him. But the trouble is, and you'll know this, that sin and pride stops us from sharing our life with God, from putting him first. You know, he made us. He has every right to be first in our lives. Every right to worship him first thing in the morning. Every right to ask for God's advice for everything we do because he's Lord and he's God. But sin and pride stop us. We know nope, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to find happiness my own way. You know, sometimes it's a bit like a really greedy footballer. 
Is there nothing worse than the part than a greedy footballer that never passes the ball? I'm just doing my own. Just doing my own. I'm good enough, I'll do it my own. Well, sometimes we can be like that spiritually, really greedy, thinking, well, I can just do it. I can live, and I, I don't need God. I don't need to think about God in my life. But he is, the whole of the Bible is about saying, don't think like that. Don't live like that. Don't live without God. Don't think that life without God is fine. He initiates from Genesis. He initiates for us a way back to himself, a way back to relationship with him, to friendship with him, and to genuine, true happiness. I'm not saying it's the easy happiness. I'm not saying it's the world's happiness. I'm saying this is true and genuine, God-given, eternal happiness, and that makes it very important. And can I just say for you this morning, there's nothing that's more important than responding to the living God, than hearing the living God and responding to Him and responding to His love and His words in our lives. I just want to say a few words about Moses here, because God speaks to Moses here in this story, story of the burning bush. And he speaks with pictures, pictures are always good, and he also speaks with words. So he speaks with pictures here, and he speaks with words. And I want to think about that just for a moment. Or he speaks with a picture, and it's this picture that maybe seems a bit distant to us, and we don't really understand anything about it, but it's a a bush that's in the middle of the desert, kind of maybe not that, probably that big a bush, and uh, we're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Moses said, I will go over and see the site why the bush does not burn up. And then, of course, God speaks through that. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here today from Arizona. Sometimes, I think there was someone last week from Arizona, but they've had really dry weather. 50 degrees. It's been horrendous. And they've had hugely uh, damaging uh, forest fires. Thousands of acres burnt by uh, the ravages of fire. And here is Moses. And remember, he's in a desert. This isn't, generally speaking, like the West Highlands of Scotland, where everything's lovely and green and luscious. This was in a desert place, tinder dry. And yet, here's this strange thing. There's a bush a, a, a small tree, and it's on fire. And that is, you know, you think that's, that's a hugely dangerous situation. It could spread all over. But it's contained, and it's also not burning up. You know, something, have you ever burnt something on a fire that's really dry? It burns up really quickly, very quickly, almost set the, la- the match to it, and it whoosh, it's away, it's gone. But here's this bush in this desert place, it's dry, and it's on fire, but it's not burning up. And there's a picture here of God, he gives a picture of his indestructible energy. He's not burned up, he doesn't tire out, he doesn't fizzle away, he's always there with his great energy. He's a pure God, fire in the Bible always speaks of purity and righteousness and goodness. And uh, God Himself speaks through the angel of the Lord uh, through it. So there's this picture of God given here. And I think very often we've lost sight of God in that way. You know, we like God as a big cuddly teddy bear. We like God as a Santa Claus figure. We like Him as someone that we can pull into our lives every now and again, maybe even sometimes just once a year at camp. I'll just think about God then, and I don't need to worry him about the rest of the year, but here's this great God, the source of all life, sovereign, infinite, powerful, real, absolutely tangible and real, who speaks to Moses. You know, Moses, um, God doesn't exist because we believe. Now listen to this and think about it. God doesn't b- exist because we believe. We believe because He exists. So whether you believe or not today makes no difference to God at the level of reality. He's still there. It's not the fact that we believe in Him that somehow makes Him real. He's real. The question is, do you believe in Him? And do you trust Him? Because He is this great, perfect, holy, infinite God. And we are 
by nature, rebels. We're not in his family. We're not even in the squad. We're living life. We're trickling along. We'll die. We'll face him. But we will not face him as a friend. We'll face him as an enemy. Sinners. Unless we listen and respond to his message. Don't suppress him. Don't push him down. Don't make him insignificant. He's this great sovereign God. Because we have this picture of him here. But you know, we are much more privileged than Moses. We've got a much better picture of God. No, I shouldn't say a much better picture. A much more, a much fuller picture of God in the New Testament where we have the same God on a cross. You picture that. Same God on a cross, dying so that you and I can live, so that we can become his children, so that Christ can be our big brother, so that his Holy Spirit can live in us and never leave us, and we become creatures who live forever with him, people who live forever. And we do two things with that great picture of the God of the burning bush that we see on the cross of Calvary. You either walk away from it or you walk towards it. So whatever you do today, you will either become closer to Jesus or further away. Nobody will be treading water. None of us will go out the same today as we came in. We're either going to be closer to him or further away. And he wants to draw us closer to himself. So he has pictures, and he also speaks with words, doesn't he? The Bible's full of words, and words are very important. And ministers always use lots and lots of words. We always go on and on and on and on and on for ages. But it's because we believe words are so important, and we want our words to be blessed and anointed by God and by the Spirit. And he speaks with words. In fact, words are so important. Jesus is called the Word in John chapter 1. He is called the Word because he tells us about himself. And we can't ignore what someone as important as God has to say. And you can imagine walking in, not now, but previously, walking into the uh, dressing room or a changing room of Manchester United at half time. And Alex Ferguson comes in and speaks to the team. People, listen. He's got something important to say. Now, I imagine Andy Murray listens to the words of Ivan Lendl. I tell you, I would, because he's scary looking. I would listen to what he says. And he doesn't say much. He doesn't smile much. I don't think he says much either, but I would listen. I think he's got things that are worth here. And for any leaders here, if you want to read about good leadership, from a human point of view, read a book about Alex Ferguson or someone like that. Great man management skills. But these people absolutely pale into significance before God who speaks. Now, will you, who, who are you listening to? Who is it that's important to you? Who, who influences you? And God says, listen to me. Listen to what I say to Moses because it still applies to us. And he says, I'm, I'm a God for real people. In verse 6, he says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm the God of real people. That's what he says. These are not fictional characters. They're not cartoon characters. They're not make-believe. These are real characters that Moses knew about. And he says, I'm a God of these real people. And that's the same then as it is now. God is the God of real people. He's God of young lads. He's the God of people here who have put their faith and trust in Him, and they know Him and love Him as their own God, real people. Can I say just a personal word here to the guys? Because the most influential years of my life were the years I went to camp. I didn't have the privilege of going to a football camp as a camper because I'm too old, and they, they didn't have them. But I was, at, I've been at, I was at the first 10 or so as a leader. But as a camper, I just went to camps. And the leaders of these camps 
undoubtedly had the greatest, other than my parents, had the greatest spiritual influence on me. They were real people who had a real Savior, and I could see that. I could see that in their lives, and that had a great impact on my whole life. Camps had a massive influence, huge influence for good, I hope, uh, maybe not for others <laughs> who were at my camps, but uh, a huge spiritual influence for good, and because God changes the lives of real people, and I could see that in a way I'd never seen before. God says, I'm a God of real people. He's not a God of the imagination. He's a God for you, and he's a God for me. And he says, I have a loving concern for you, uh, for them, and for you. He says, talks in verse 7 about, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out from their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. It's not a beautiful word. I'm concerned about their suffering. The living God. God reveals himself in this way. He's concerned about the suffering of his people. I have a loving concern. It might not have seemed like it for them in Egypt. They were slaves. Things were very bad. Moses himself might have wondered, what is God speaking about? I've been 40 years in Egypt, and then I've been driven out, and now I've been 40 years in the desert as a shepherd. It's not exactly leadership stuff that's going on. I'm 80 years old. What's God saying that he's got concern? But God is saying, I do. And I said, trust me, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free. Now, we have deeper evidence, obviously, in the cross of Jesus Christ. He can't love you anymore. Now, I've got four children. They're all grown up, bar one, who's at your camp, Ross. But if I was in a situation where I had to stand somewhere at the front, and someone said to me, it's either you or them. You die or they die. I hope and pray, and I know. I say, I've had 49 good years. I'll go. Let them live. That's what I would say. Let them live. And God says, greater love is no man than this than that he lay down his life. For his friends now, I'm doing it because they're my children. I do that they're my flesh and blood. But God did that for us while we are still enemies from him. And he is God. That's how much he loves. And that's what you need to consider. And he goes on to say, I have a purpose and a plan for you. In verses 8 and 10, I want to bring you into this land that's flowing with milk and honey. I've got a plan and a purpose for you, deliverance and a future. And for every one of us here, he has a purpose and a plan. Now, I don't know what that is. I don't even know what it is for me as it lays ahead in the future. I know what it is just now, but I don't know what it is in the future. But I can say that his purpose and plan for every believer at a kind of most basic level is to be like Jesus, is to be Christ-like. All the leaders, all the campers who trust in Jesus Christ, the kids, everyone who's a member here, everyone who's taken Christ as Lord and Savior, whatever other plans he has for you, however great or not by the world standards, he has a plan that you become as Christ-like as he makes you. Now, that's tough. That is a tough call. And Moses was afraid of what God's purpose and plan was for him. And it's tough to be like Jesus, tough as a young boy to be like Jesus, tough in the football team to be like Jesus, tough as a leader to be like Jesus, tough as a minister to be like Jesus. It's tough in your workplace, in your studies, in your unemployment, in the good times and the bad times. Whatever else God has for us, He wants us to be like Jesus Christ. Remember that. Remember that purpose and plan. And that's fearful. And sometimes you're afraid of what Jesus wants and afraid of what the future holds and afraid of what might happen. Well, God doesn't mind us being afraid. He doesn't mind Moses being afraid. But he does say to Moses, look, I will provide for you. I will provide for you. He speaks uh, 
at the end, and he speaks about his presence throughout it, verse 9, and then verse 22, he speaks about the material provisions he's going to give them. He's going to give them plunder from the Egyptians to provide for them. He will do the impossible. And that's very significant to remember that He will always provide for us. Now, in the Christian life, which is a race, and with this I'm going to finish, the Christian life can be like, uh, and it's described by Paul as like being a a race. Now, I know that's different from football, uh, but it's described as being like a race. If you're to run a race, uh, you're in the race, or you're at the start of the race, and you're at the start of that race, and you've got a big woolen jumper on. It might be hot outside, big, thick woolen jumper on, and three layers underneath it. And you've decided that you're also going to take your iPad with you, because it might tell you what the temperature's like on the way around, and who might be behind you, or anything like that. And you also want to wear your favorite hiking boots boots to run this race because they're comfortable and you've worn them all the time. Big, thick, heavy hiking boots. That's going to make your race very difficult. You're going to be disadvantaged among all the other race uh, people who are racing because you've got all these things that are going to hold you back. And Paul speaks about getting rid of the things that will hold you back in the Christian race, the sins. So you get rid of the sins. You take off the big, thick, woolly jumper. You get rid of the sins that were going to stop you following and serving Jesus. You've got to do it. He will give you the strength to do that. Also, the distractions. You've got to be focused, not with an iPad, focused on the race, focused on the finishing line. And you've also got to wear the right footwear. You can't make the wrong choices. You've got to rely on God and on His Spirit. That's hugely significant running his race. We've got responsibilities to get rid of sin, to be focused, to make the right choices. You can only do that with God, with Christ as your Savior and depending on Him. You've got to be reading your Bible. You've got to be praying. Uh, it, there's, no, there's no other way. I don't know for a while, maybe not since you guys were growing up, but maybe in the 80s and 90s, in some Christian circles, it was it was kind of laughed at or mocked a little bit in some circles to have a quiet time. You know, we've gone beyond that. We've moved beyond these things. Nonsense. Every day, learn to read the Bible. Every day, pray. Spend time with God. Get rid of the distractions. Be fit for His race as you put your trust in Him. But also remember, not just that, but remember He gives you great help. He gives you His supernatural spiritual power to follow and serve him. Have you ever been to an airport? Airports are great places. And the, the best bit about the airport I like is these flat kind of uh, conveyor belts. They're like escalators, except they're flat. Because you can walk at a normal pace and you can pass everyone. <laughs> you're walking and you feel like Superman. Because you're walking just normally and then you're passing people who are struggling with bags because you've got this help. It's got a flat conveyor belt and you can go really fast. Well, when we're following Christ, when we're in His way, when we're getting rid of the distractions by His grace and help, He gives us that strength to be able to walk the Christian walk. And He says, you know, there's a cross, yeah, things we've got to give up. But He says, my burden is light. It's hard and it's easy. It's both. It's recognizing that He gives us the strength and the help and it's trusting in Him. So I'm asking you to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to continue doing so as believers. Remember His name. He speaks about His name here. I am uh, who I am. I am got time to go into that. The great name of God, the redeeming name of God. Now, very soon, all our names will be forgotten. They talk about a couple of generations. Everyone's name is forgotten. And you might try to forget the name of Jesus. It's a name that's ridiculed, and it's a name that's rejected, and it's a name that's not very cool for many people. But what about you? Because the name of Jesus is one name that will not be forgotten. One day everyone will stand before him, 
and he is the sovereign Lord and God. And he offers us grace. He offers us forgiveness. He offers us salvation if we will trust in him and in his way, which is the way of the cross. So please remember that. I pray for the guys, particularly at the camp. These are special times. And I pray for your leaders, that they will be filled with God's Spirit as they lead you. And I pray for all of us uh, that we will know Jesus more. I would like just to bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to pray for all the camps and also remember the camps in Eastern Europe. We've got Kathleen and Martin who are leaving this week with some others to go to Eastern Europe uh, to help at uh, language camps there. So let's pray for them. Lord God, uh, we do thank you for your word. We pray for its power in our lives. We pray that your spirit would take uh, from your truth and apply it to us. Uh, we pray that you would bless all the camps that uh, are on this summer run by the Free Church. Thank you for those that have already gone and have been uh, blessed by you. We pray for those that are on going today and this week and those that will still happen in the next few weeks. Lord, they've been such a blessing to us as a denomination, as a church. They have been so uh, powerful in transforming the lives of so many people. And we ask, I really pray for your spirit and your, your grace and your goodness to remain with them. We pray for Eastern Europe, for Christ, and for the various camps that they are running this summer. We thank you for them. Pray for Martin and Kathleen as they leave this week and for their team. We thank you for all their team who will be going from here. We remember many others going from here for next week to South Uist, to the camp there. And we pray your blessing on them. And we do re remember also today uh, SU camps and for the great work they do and for the number of young people that will be there having fun, having a holiday, but also learning about Jesus Christ. May that be significant and important to them and to us all. Protect us, protect us from the evil one, protect us from our own hearts, and protect us uh, from uh, those who would uh, pull us away from Christ. We ask it in his precious name. Amen.